Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by Marshall University, with more than 100 degree programs offered in four locations and online. More about the Marshall family at marshall.edu. Good evening from the Capitol Building in Charleston. I'm Suzanne Higgins. On the legislature today, the multiple challenges West Virginia's active military and veterans endure because of their service and legislation addressing many of those concerns. But first, our news update with senior reporter Dave Mistich and reporter Emily Allen. Welcome to both of you this evening. Thanks. Emily, let's start with you. Um, in the House Finance uh, Committee meeting this morning, the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Resources, uh, Jeremiah Samples, was giving his agency's uh, budget presentation. This is a huge budget, $6 billion, uh, more than $4 billion from federal funding. Tell us what happened this morning. Yeah, so it was Jeremiah Samples, but also Bill Crouch was there, the actual secretary secretary. And according to him and Jeremiah, they have three priorities this year. They're going to use their budget to address um, substance use disorder or addiction, child welfare, and um, you know aging facilities like hospitals, but also, I guess it's just hospitals this time around, but they did talk a little bit about how their laboratories are in kind of a state of disrepair at this point too. Um, but child welfare, obviously, we've heard so much about it this session over interims, last session, there's 7,000 kids in foster care. Um, you know, just last week they were talking at a meeting about how at the end of December there were 77, you know, missing or, disappeared at a time. One number that came up in this next clip we're going to play has to do with the number of children who are um, in the foster care system, but they're not in a home. They're either in like a residential group facility or an emergency shelter. Um, so this clip that we're going to play now is from Delegate Barrett, and uh, he's in a back and forth with Jeremiah Samples, the Deputy Secretary. Is it your belief that we have some children in these type of facilities that if we had more foster families could be in a foster home? I'm not suggesting the entire 2,800, but there are some, is that correct? Yeah, we're, we're working aggressively to get these children out of institutional care. We have about 1,000 kids, roughly, that are in institutional care, uh, either, a, either a PRTF, um, well, th these are for the residentials, uh, PRTFs, acute psych, uh, and the group residentials, we have about 1,000 kids. And then for emergency shelter, uh, I don't have that number off the top of my head, um, but um, we have several hundred kids in emergency shelter as well. We do believe that uh, it's critical to get those kids into a familial placement, a family, and have them in that family uh, permanently to the extent that that's possible. So the more foster families that we have that are able to deal with children with acute needs, I do think it would mitigate the uh, number of kids in these institutional settings. So we know the problems mm -hmm. and the actual budget um, they're proposing, I, I think notably, you know, staffing increases to CPS. They're talking about an improvement plan for the foster care ombudsman or ombudswoman, rather they've already hired her, um, you know, expanded mental health in schools, all sorts of things focused on child welfare. Um, they're also proposing kind of increases to maintaining the hospital facilities and um, an increase to help state matches to the federal funds and the child health insurance program because traditionally in west virginia um, according to jeremiah samples federal matches have covered the whole thing uh, now that they're kind of pulling that back just a little bit we need some money state wise to match that well at, at the same time that that was happening that the deputy secretary was giving his um, budget presentation uh, Democrats from both the House and Senate were downstairs uh, doing their own press conference on uh, foster care, on substance use disorder, uh, 
child welfare issues, bills that they feel are not moving quickly enough. Uh, there was Senator Stephen Baldwin of Greenbrier County, Delegate Amanda Eastep Burton of Kanawha, Delegate Lisa Zukoff of Marshall County, and they were talking about that, that bill you just mentioned, Emily, House Bill uh, 4092, the Foster Care Bill of Rights. It raises salaries for CPS workers, more input for, from uh, foster families into, into the, the child's care plan and, and being able to um, participate in court hearings. That was very important. But the big, the big um, ticket item that they say is 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 holding things up in house finance um, is that sixteen million dollar uh, fiscal note that would go with raising the per diems of um, kinship families uh, as compared to what foster families get. And kinships, of course, well, a lot of grandparents, of them, yeah. right? Um, and and kinship is is a lot of grandparents out there that we hear. Um, other, they, they, they want other legislation to keep moving, and um, that has, uh, you know, that was their message this morning. But then I, I have to say that the House Health and Human Resources Chair, Jordan Hill, then put out a press release this afternoon saying that the House of Delegates unanimously has sent out two of those three bills. 4092 is being thoroughly looked at, and he expected that the final foster bill was uh, soon to happen. Now, Dave, let me bring you into the conversation sure. here over in the Senate. Um, uh, actually, the governor put out a press release this afternoon about uh, state revenue collections for January. We had heard a slightly different story in the Senate earlier today. Right, right. So Senator Craig Blair basically just reiterated the same information uh, for, for collections in January. It's a $13 million surplus. But Democrats, particularly, um, you know, Senate Min Major Minority Leader Roman Prezioso took issue with the way that that, n that number, how they got to that number, that $13 million surplus. We'll hear from him and his remarks on the Senate floor today. Amazing. We don't print money, but the governor can play around with the estimates any way he wants to. And uh, as the chairman had, had presented to us, if it wasn't for the... Uh, Six million dollars of or six million dollars of loan, the revenue estimates for January, and the gift from the treasurer of twenty million dollars, which are one-time money, uh, which totals twenty-six million, we would uh, then deduct our current dilemma in January, and we'd be thirteen million below revenue estimates. So it's amazing the governor in the state of the states, you know, painted a very rosy picture, but yet. When we see the numbers, it's, it's a totally different story. And then, Dave, that led to uh, the talk about the proposed resolution that could lead to uh, a, a lessening of taxes for big manufacturers. That's right. And we've heard about the you know, Senate Joint Resolution 8, which is the one on the manufacturing uh, uh, tax, uh, a repeal, which would be a constitutional amendment for that. There's also Senate Joint Resolution 9, which calls for um, you know, a look at, at personal property taxes on the whole, and it would allow the legislature through legislation and not a resolution uh, to do that piecemeal if they wanted to into the future. Um, uh, again, both those require a two-thirds majority for, uh, you know, for these to pass. Uh, and then, of course, it would go to the ballot. You know, you're going to hear this, you know, me sitting in this chair and others saying that same thing over and over and over again this session. And, uh, you know, uh, Senator Doug Facemeyer, uh, he, he got up, a Democrat got up and spoke today about, uh, you know, this, the, the idea of getting Democrats on board uh, to make this resolution pass. See, a lot of these bills that are coming out that require a two-thirds vote, in my opinion, it appears to me like that y'all know it's not going to happen because we're not going to allow it. And then when it's over, we're going to stand up and say, we tried to do these things, and the daggone Democrats wouldn't vote and let it. And here's the reason I feel this way. You guys have said constantly, Mr. President, that you will not do this until you have a plan. Well, where's the plan? We've not had one meeting to even discuss the plan. And now we come up with another one to reduce people's taxes because it sounds good. My question is, are we seriously wanting dialogue about these issues, or are we just having a political stunt here? 
Mm. And again, Suzanne, this is, you know, he's talking about a plan and this, this idea of a plan is, is to make the counties whole because the money that comes in from these, these tax, this tax revenue funds education on the counties. And there's a big concern by Democrats as to how that, whether there'd be a, re, a replacement revenue stream or how we would make sure that counties do not take a hit in all this. Uh, you know, Senator Tarr of Putnam County, a Republican, got up and spoke today as well on this issue, and we'll hear a little bit from his remarks on the Senate floor. We have got to diversify, and we've, the talk has been, and it's just been talk for years and years and years, and real action has yet to be taken to diversify that economy and get off that volatility that we experience with severance tax. So giving the legislature the ability to actually put it on the ballot. So we vote to actually put it on the ballot to let the people of West Virginia decide whether or not West Virginia needs to be more nimble than we are now in such a rapidly changing economy, or do we stick to the Titanic we've been on where we can't steer it at all? Because I tell you, the direction it's went, going on the history of just depending on a severance tax and increasing it, which will eventually drive it down even more that's simple economics. Tax it more, you get less. Is not the way to go. And Suzanne, you know, you've heard Senator Jarre get up and speak a lot about this. You know, the argument that he's been making all along is that, you know, if we repeal this manufacturing tax, tax businesses will come here. This, this, in, these types of industries will grow and grow and grow. And you've heard, you know, this discussion. Uh, you know, it's it's been bubbling up all throughout the session. We'll hear really quickly from uh, Senator Mike Azinger of Wood County. He's a Republican uh, who, who tried to, to, to sort of paint this as a very partisan issue on the Senate floor today. I just uh, want to let the record show in terms of the conversation that's gone on so far this morning, which side of the aisle is for cutting the taxes of the citizens of West Virginia and which side of the aisle is against cutting the taxes for the citizens of West Virginia, for the manufacturers of West Virginia, and so on. David did go back and forth. How did it wrap up somewhat today? Right. So, you know, as you heard from some Senator Azinger there trying to paint this as a very Democrat versus Republican issue, Democrats are, 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 have, a, have so far basically said that they're willing to have this conversation but have not been invited to the table to have this conversation about how we replace these revenue streams. Uh, we'll, we'll sort of wrap up this discussion with, with some remarks by Senator uh, Bob Plymel of Cabell County, a Democrat, who basically said that these things are very complicated and that the conversations that, that's been had on the Senate floor is not indicative of, of what they're trying to handle. We can talk about all this stuff about all oh, this side of the aisle, or that side of the aisle, I'll just go and just say this. Go look at the past and see how fiscally responsible we've been in addressing the issues of this state. And don't start trying to put someone in this column or that column. We did that collectively. Dave, thanks so much for being here. Emily has already hopped off to, to attend another meeting. I appreciate you being here. Thank you. And we'll be back in just a moment. For 50 years, West Virginia Public Broadcasting has been dedicated to the people of the Mountain State. Time and time again, when the nation's called, West Virginians have answered in a greater number per capita. Anytime I wear the Medal of Honor, I don't wear it for what I did. I wear it for those, particularly those two Marines, who gave their life, really, protecting mine. You send an 18-year-old kid to war, and they cross that bridge from peacetime into wartime, there's no way they ever come back. There's no way. That bridge is burnt. That bridge is burnt behind them. West Virginia, in terms of taking care of their vets, is very close to the bottom. And it's really unfortunate. And it won't take a lot to fix it. But you have to listen to what we say, what we know is going to work.
Welcome back to the legislature today. Later this week, veterans will gather at the Capitol for Veterans Visibility Day, an opportunity to speak with lawmakers about many of the challenges they face and perhaps some policy changes to address those. Joining me now to talk about some of that work are Chair of the Senate Military Committee, Senator Ryan Weld, Majority Whip from Brook County, and Senator Douglas Facemeyer of Braxton County, a longtime member of the committee. Thank you both for joining me tonight. Thanks for having, thanks for having um, me. Senator Weld, let's begin with you. I'd like to start very broadly before we get into specific bills, very broadly about those issues that military families, um, uh, veterans face um, that non-military families and uh, families that don't have veterans just um, cannot really comprehend unless they are immersed or, or educated. So talk about what we know, the impact of training, responsibilities, deployment, and that transition back to, to home. I think that the first thing that I would point out is the responsibilities that are put on these individuals, sometimes the, the burdens that they bear. Um, veterans make up about 1% of our population but make up about 19%, tragically, of all suicides committed in the United States. And so that obviously means that there's a burden being placed on these individuals. And how can we find those people and get them the help that they need? And I, I think that's one of the biggest challenges that they face, but that we face in having a responsibility to people who have been called to serve in a war that they didn't ask for, but have been a part of. Uh, Senator Facemeyer, what, um, you know, these issues of, of, of suicide, of drug addiction, homelessness, mental illness, um, why is it so important? I mean, these challenges are faced broadly in, in our population, but when it comes to veterans and, and uh, military personnel, active uh, military personnel, why and how is it important to, to look through, look at these um, th these crises uh, through the ends of the, uh, through the lens of military experience. Well, you know, first of all, I think as a country and a government, we owe it to these folks who put their life on the lines, not only for the active members but for their family. Um, you know, it's it's one thing thinking that your dad's going to work today and you hope everything's okay and you'll see him this evening. It's something else if your dad or your mother is going deployed and you're not going to see for months and you have no idea what they're going to face and when they're going to come home and the shape that they're going to come home. And, and you know, to think about the, the stress and things that these people go through uh, and, 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 and another thing I think it's very important to remember is that they volunteered. You know, they love this country enough that they volunteered to go and serve. So I think as a country, we owe them everything that we can. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's just remarkable the sacrifices that these folks make as well as their families. You know, Senator Weld, um, we, we work out of this area. And I had a couple people ask me, as they do every day, what's on the show tonight? And I said, military and veterans issues. And they kind of looked at me like, why? I mean, it, it, it's really not on our radar day to day. And to state the obvious, we're at war and we have been, and uh, we, we have West Virginia citizens over there. And as you pointed out, they volunteer, and many of them are 18, 20, 22 years old. Um, it's just not as a part of the, the, the conversation uh, in a, to the extent that it should be. Yep. And, and it really does need to be because we have asked so much of so many people going back to when we started our involvement in Afghanistan back in 2001. Uh, then we started our involvement in Iraq in 2003. And so starting at that point in time, moving forward, we have people you know, on a forward deployment operation in places like Syria. Uh, we saw a couple of years ago, unfortunately, where four members of our uh, armed forces lost their lives in, uh, in Africa. I mean, we have people that are, you know, a part of operations all over the globe. And so what we can do back here is just keep that in mind as we try to find ways to allow for the state to offer better services to them and allow for us to recognize the cost that they've endured through things that we can do. And I, I feel that it's the, the least that we can do. And when you talk about West Virginians being deployed, I, I remember when I was in Afghanistan in 2010, deployed with the Air Force, we left the passenger terminal at Kandahar 
to go to our, uh, our FOB, our forward operating base, on a C-130, and the, the, the tail was painted Charlie West. And so mm. it was wow. a West Virginia C-130 that was there to give us a ride. Wow. Um, Senator Facemeyer, when, um, when it comes to veterans, one of the issues that um, has, has been forefront in the mind, especially of Southern West Virginia veterans, has been um, that planned veterans nursing home in Beckley. Uh, is there an update on uh, when that might, might be seen? Well, I mean, the, the, it all comes down to money, and unfortunately, the state itself does not have the funds to do that. We're, we're going to have to have help from the federal government, and uh, I think Senator Weld can tell you that, that you know we're trying, and we just can't get that commitment. We can't get that for sure commitment from the federal government. I think it's a travesty. Uh, you know, West Virginia has always per capita sent more people to war than any other state. We're a proud state. Our citizens love this country and do everything they can to support it. And here we are needing a hospital in southern West Virginia. And the senator can probably tell you better than me, but I think this thing's been going on for close to 15 or 20 years that we've been trying to get this, and we just can't get the commitment out of the federal government to, to build it. It's been several years, and, and, and he's exactly correct. And so we have to hit a certain amount for matching in order for the federal government to come in. And we have several dedicated sources that, of revenue that go to this, like uh, part of the fireworks, uh, the you know, tax, tax that we that, get from that yeah, now. A couple years ago. But we, we need to, to be able to, to find a little more within our budget so that finally the federal government will come in and help us. Uh, this year, uh, Senator Weld, you have passed the uh, Green Alert program. Tell us about that. So the Green Alert program operates almost exactly like the, the Amber Alert or the Silver Alert for senior citizens in that it operates for active duty members and veterans who are at risk because of a physical or mental condition that is linked to their time in service. So if they go missing, how are we going to better track them? How are we going to be able to find them better? And it goes to exactly what the Amber Alert program does, by getting the information out to law enforcement, to the Turnpike Authority, to be on the lookout for this individual and the vehicle that's associated with them because they're deemed to be at risk because of an issue from their, uh, their time in service. Uh, Wisconsin was the first state to do this, and I think that if we implement it here, I think it really could help some people who are considering maybe hurting themselves or others. All right, Senator Facemeyer, another uh, bill that got through the Senate uh, provides uh, continued eligibility for developmental disability services to dependents of military members. Why was that important? Well, you know, it's a family deal. And when someone in your family is involved in the military, regardless of what, the, the whole family is involved. And I think that it's important, and also I would hope that it would also give our active duty uh, men and women a little bit of um, encouragement or maybe some uh, peace of mind knowing that if something happens to one of their family members that there's people back here trying to help. And I think that's important. I mean, you know, w one of the greatest things about West Virginia, I, I believe, is, is our love for our family and trying to do what we can for our family. And I can only imagine being deployed, having <coughs> children back here and, you know, not really knowing everything that, that, that's being done. Uh, the senator uh, was deployed and, and we, we thank him for his service and he's still, he's still active in the reserves. He has some kind of an idea. Myself personally, I can only imagine what it would be like uh, to, to be over there. Of course, I'm at the place now where me and my wife have grandchildren. And, and I mean, just, just to think about your kids being back here uh, and you not being there, it, it's, it's got to be a void for you that you're trying to fill. And, and I, anything that we can do along these lines, it's our obligation and we owe it to these people. Senator Weld, I wanted you to speak to, um, to uh, Senate Bill 203 briefly. This is having to do with tax refund fund contributions. And, and, and again, so we've seen some other states that have implemented something like this where you, know, you get your income tax refund, um, maybe say, you know what, I'm going to donate 100 bucks, 50 bucks, whatever it might be, to uh, the Department of Veterans Assistance or to our state uh, veterans cemetery here in West Virginia. 
I think we should just be able to do that. Ask. Yeah, it just makes it, mm -hmm. it it's, it's an ask, and if you want to do it and facilitate that payment, that's great. And so I think that hopefully that's something that we get across the finish line and get done this year. Uh, I want to talk real briefly. We only have a moment. The Veterans Court, uh, military, military drug court that you had established up in uh, up in Brook County, um, implemented this fall. Is there any measurable impact so far? I know that the program is already taking individuals and veterans on as uh, part of the program. I think it's great. This is something that the state used to have, but was it wasn't written in code, and so the uh, previous Supreme Court iteration got rid of it. But we have it back now, and I think it's something that's going to pay dividends. Uh, I mentioned that uh, veterans' visibility is later this week, and just the the moment that we have left, um, you know, a message or a promise you want to give them for this session. Sandra? Well, the first thing is, you know. We thank you for your service. We certainly do not underplay the importance of what you do. And, uh, you know, Chairman Weld and the military committee has made it, made it quite clear that, that what we're trying to do on this committee is help our, our, our people that are enlisted in our military. And I just want to, to, to thank them for what they do and for their sacrifices. Senator Weld. They are not forgotten. Their cause is not forgotten. What they did on behalf of our state and our country is not forgotten. I love Veterans Visibility Day, and I love having them here. Senator Ryan Weld of Brook County, Senator uh, Douglas Facemeyer of Braxton County, thank you both for joining me Thanks tonight. For having thank you. Tomorrow on the legislature today, what officials say is the escalating problem of senior hunger and isolation. We'll speak with the president of the West Virginia Directors of Senior and Community Services. I'm Suzanne Higgins. For everyone here at West Virginia Public Broadcasting, thanks for joining us. Have a great evening. West Virginia Public Broadcasting would like to thank the businesses and organizations who provide support for telling West Virginia's story. If your business or organization would like to build awareness of services, products, or events with a statewide public television